um, just a very quick introduction to geometric group theory uh, because I know it's maybe not a subject that's studied uh, here. Um, so let me, let me start with uh, notation. So gamma is going to be a finitely generated group. And S is going to be some finite generating set. Okay, so sometimes I will make abbreviations of, of my words. So S is a finite generating set, and since we want to do geometric group theory, we need some kind of metric on it. So the metric we put on gamma is the word metric. And the word metric is given by the distance between G and H in gamma is just the length of the word G in verse H, where the length is calculated uh, by counting how many elements of S and, and S inverse it takes to write uh, G in verse H. So this is word length in S union S inverse. So this is why I put a subscript S, because it depends on my generating set, as we will see really briefly. So let me do some examples. So if I take the group gamma is equal to z and the generating set um, s equals 1, and I can throw a negative 1 so that already uh, it is um, s union s inverse is s again. So what does this look like? So here is gamma. And I'm going to represent it geometrically by putting um, an edge between any two elements that differ by a generating set. So let's say this is. So 0 and negative 1, 0 and 1. OK, so like this. OK, so this, this is, these dotted lines give, indicate how um, distance one between these two vertices. Okay, so the other example I'm going to do is S equals two, three. So I'm adding negative two and negative three. Then what do I have now? So any, any vertices that are distance two apart, let me add one more here. Any vertices that are distance two apart are, um, uh, sorry, that distance two apart here are now distance one. And also, if they are three apart, they're now distance one apart. Okay, so in particular, you see that. Um, so let me, actually, I should call this something else. This should be S prime. So gamma with the metric give, uh, derived from S is not the same as uh, the metric space I get when I look at um, metric S prime. Let me do one more example. The free group on two generators. So these are all strings of elements, A, B, and A inverse, and B inverse. This has... Um, if I want, so what it really what I'm drawing right here, and maybe this looks familiar, is really just I'm drawing the Cayley graph to help me visualize what this metric space looks like. Okay, so here, if I take my generating set to be, let's say, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, then what I get is something that looks like like this, where again each of these edges. And I'm not going to keep drawing this. Um, here, my vertices are my elements of the group, and the edges represent either an A, B, A inverse, B inverse. Okay, so this is this is the Cayley graph of the free group on two letters. Okay, so I'm going to leave that up because we're going to need it in a second. So I already mentioned that um, uh, ds depends on 
on S. So if we want to talk about the geometry of a group, we need some kind of notion, some sort of equivalence, so that all of these metrics that we get in this manner are actually equivalent under this equivalent. So this is where by Lipschitz equivalence comes in. So they depend on S, but all such metrics on gamma are by Lipschitz equivalent. So let me tell you what a by Lipschitz equivalence is. Okay, so we say that a map between two metric spaces is, um, and I will short it to, <laughs> shorten it to a by lip equivalence. Okay. If, well, this is something maybe we remember, or maybe we've forgotten from analysis class from way back when. <laughs> Um, so by Lipschitz map is one that satisfies that there exists a constant k such that um, for all points in my space X, the distance of the image points is at most k times um, the distance of my original points. Let me move this over. Um, okay, and the second condition, since we want this just to be an equivalent, is that f has to be onto. So f is a surjection. So this is the condition for a by Lipschitz equivalence. Okay. So the second uh, term in my title was quasi-isometric equivalence. So usually, geometric group theorists, theorists don't consider um, by Lipschitz equivalence. They consider quasi-isometric equivalence. So let me tell you what this is. So definition, again, this will be a map between two metric spaces, is a quasi-isometric equivalence. Um, so now we want two constants, k and c, such that for all x, y, and x. So quasi-isometric equivalence is going to be a coarse version of by Lipschitz equivalence. So it's going to be quite related to this, but what we're going to allow now is not just this uh, by Lipschitz inequality to hold. We want we will also allow an additive constant on either side of the equality. And furthermore, we, we will not require f to be onto. We will only require f to be coarsely onto. So some neighborhood of, let's say, some C neighborhood of the image is all of the target space. OK, so since I know that um, this is not taught in usual uh, undergraduate analysis classes, let me, let me do some examples. So let me consider a map that takes, um, so I'm going to let z be my, uh, my first metric space x, and r with the usual metric to be my target metric space. So this looks something like this. Z, and here is R. And F, I'm going to let be the map that just sends the integer to the integer. OK, so this map, let's say this is, this map is not, is not onto, OK? But it is coarsely onto, because the, let's say the one neighborhood uh, of, of f of z is actually all of r. OK, so it's coarsely onto. Um, 
So two is satisfied. Or rather, maybe I should write this in the red font. Red two is satisfied. Okay. Um, let me give you another example. I'm going to call this map F bar. This is a map from R to Z. And it's going to take um, the image of x is just going to be the greatest uh, integer less than x. OK, this map is not continuous, so there's no way it can be by Lipschitz. Um, but it is coarsely by Lipschitz. So at most, I am tearing. So you should think of this C constant as tearing. Um, at most, I am tearing by, by 1. So this is not um, by Lipschitz, but um, coarsely by Lipschitz. OK, so, and in fact, each of these maps satisfies both 1 and 2, right? So, so I hope this example maybe illustrates one of the reasons that um, quasi-isometry is a desirable equivalence to study, because what it lets us do is it lets us compare these discrete spaces with spaces that we are maybe more familiar with, like, OK, so this example is a little trivial. But um, in general, um, so one of the fundamental sort of lemmas, fundamental facts we use is that the fundamental group of a compact Riemannian manifold um, is quasi-isometric to its universal cover. So we can study fun those groups via the geometry of these nice continuous spaces that we know a lot about. So that's kind of the, the idea uh, behind using quasi-isometric equivalents. Except today, um, I don't want to talk about that aspect of geometric group theory. I want to um, just jump right into the kind of questions we ask here. OK, so, so the standard question So, so by introducing these, this equivalent, we have um, we know that all word metrics on a group are quasi-isometric to each other, or by Lipschitz to each other. And now the standard question is, um, which other groups, lambda, are quasi-isometric, so I'm going to, um, this is for short, I'm going to just write QI, which other finitely generated groups are QI to gamma? So this is, this is sort of the standard question we ask in geometric group theory, and let me just give you the standard first example that, that we get right away, and that is that if I have a subgroup of gamma that is finite index. Then this subgroup is quasi-isometric to gamma. Okay, and the standard joke of geometric um, geometric group theorists is that uh, finite groups are trivial because they're all quasi-isometric to the trivial group but we don't like to say that because it's maybe not so polite. Um, OK, so, so what's next? <clears throat> well, so the way I've set this up, I hope that you're asking the question, why, what about by Lipschitz equivalents? OK, so we know we, I, well, I asserted that all word metrics are by Lipschitz equivalent to each other. Do the other two? Um, are the two equivalence relations the same? And so this is the, the, the theme of the talk today. So how, so is uh, by Lipschitz equivalence the same as, is it equivalent to uh, quasi-isometric equivalence? And the answer, as you can guess from my title, is no. Okay, so today, 
what I will do is I will give you um, two groups that are quasi-isometric, but not, uh, but not by Lipschitz equivalent. So these two groups will not be by Lipschitz equivalent. Okay, and in fact, because of the way I've written it, you're probably wondering, well, is one of them going to be a finite index subgroup of the other? Yes, it is. Okay, but we don't need to know that right now. Okay. So let me give you a couple of facts about quasi-isometries. Okay, so the first fact um, is that actually for, and this, this more relates by Lipschitz equivalence to quasi-isometric equivalence. Um, if I have a bijective quasi-isometry, then that's the same thing as a by Lipschitz equivalence. Okay, so, so at least for finitely generated groups, um, a bijective quasi-isometry is equivalent to um, a bi-Lipschitz map. Okay. So sometimes instead of saying these two groups are bi-Lipschitz equivalent, I will say there is a bijective quasi-isometry between them. Okay. It's the same thing. And the second uh, fact about quasi-isometries is that um, if I have two maps now, let's say F and G, that are bounded distance in the soup norm, so let's say in the soup norm the two maps are bounded distance, then if, one if, if F is a quasi-isometry, then so is G. So then F a quasi-isometry is the same as G being a quasi-isometry. And you can see that fairly easy. Well, suppose F satisfies this inequality and G is bounded distance. I just increase this C constant here and I, again, have a quasi-isometry. Okay, so the actual values of the constants we don't care about. We just care that they exist. Okay, so combining these two facts, I will sometimes say this map is bounded distance from, okay, this quasi-isometry is bounded distance from a bijection. And that will mean that the maps are bi Lipschitz, that the spaces are, uh, there's a bi Lipschitz map between them. Okay. Okay, so now for a little bit of history. So, so this whole sort of area and studying which groups are quasi-asymmetric to which other groups you can say that was uh, started by Gromov with his study of nilpotent groups. Um, the history of this question is in one of sort of the seminal papers he asked, um, well, what about if I have two free groups For instance, the group, uh, the free group on two letters and um, the free group on three letters. So the, he asked, "Is are those two by Lipschitz equivalent?" Okay. And Kevin White answered, "Yes." And in fact, he said more. He said that any quasi-isometry um, is bounded distance. from a bijection, okay. So any quasi-isometry, if I move it a bounded distance amount, then I get a bi Lipschitz equivalence. And not only between these two groups, but for all non-amenable groups. And I will define this for, this for you in a second. Okay, so it turns out um, that 
For amenable groups, which I will also define in a second, this is not the case. So not true for amenable. Okay, and in particular, if gamma is amenable, and gamma naught is a finite index subgroup, a proper finite index subgroup, then this inclusion of this finite index subgroup is, is never bounded distance from a bijection. Okay, this does not mean that there is not some uh, by Lipschitz map between these two groups. It's just that the obvious map, including the finite index subgroup, is not bounded distance from a bijection. That's not a bi Lipschitz map. Or you can't, it's, not, it's not bounded distance from a bi Lipschitz map. Okay, so now I guess I owe you this definition. And this is not the tra traditional definition. Yes? Yes, for all amenable groups, it's not true that any quasi-isometry is bounded distance. I mean, some of them are, but not. It, it, this statement is very strong. It says that any quasi-isometry is bounded distance. Here, there are examples of quasi-isometries that are not. For example, including a finite index. Okay, so uh, let me define for you what non-amenable means. And um, so I chose a definition that's sort of familiar to more people because it's been in the news lately. So uh, a non-amenable group is one that admits a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> or uh, in the news lately, uh, a, Ma a Madoff scheme, okay? <laughs> this is not, not the other kind of scheme that people might be familiar with. Um, let, me, let me show you th by examples. Um, so let's take this group here. Let's imagine these are people who have one dollar, and I will prescribe to you how to give money to your neighbor so that everybody makes, makes something, so everyone doubles their profits. So this person up here gives a dollar to this vertex here. This vertex also gives a dollar to this one here. This one gives away his dollar, and he doesn't talk to this neighbor. Now, if you propagate this, um, you can see that at every vertex, at most one arrow, one relationship will be prescribed. So you can fill in the other ones however you choose. And everybody will have gained a dollar, right? So following this, propagating it uh, on this infinite graph, um, everybody gains a dollar. So this is, a, this is an example of a non-amenable group, and this is an example of a Ponzi scheme. So everyone gets uh, $2, okay? Starting with one, uh, starting with one. So, so notice this map that, that um, takes, uh, that distributes this money in this way is bounded distance from the identity. Right? You moved points at, at most distance one. You just gave it to your neighbor. Okay? So, um, so what I would like to say is that we have a, a two to one map. So everyone gets two point two two dollars uh, bounded distance from the identity. Now, if you try to do the same thing here on Z, it's not going to be possible, right? If you start here, say, okay, well, this one is going to give me a dollar here. Maybe I don't give a dollar here. Now he has no, no dollars. So the next, you try to get two more dollars from here, and it's just not going to be possible. You're going to have to keep going further and further away. 
Okay, so this is an example of an amenable group, no Ponzi schemes, and this is non-amenable. <coughs> okay? So you can sort of imagine um, what happens if you have a map between non-amenable groups that is missing some dollars, what can you do? Well, you run a Ponzi scheme. You're bringing more dollars bound a distance apart. So every quasi-isometry, it might miss some points, it might hit too many points, but you can redistribute the wealth without moving anything very far. Okay? Okay, so now I can tell you about the examples, the counterexamples. So remember I promised you two groups that are quasi-isometric that are not by Lipschitz equivalent. So clearly these examples have to be amenable, okay? So these are actually very popular groups to study in geometric group theory because, because they actually come up as counterexamples on many occasions. And I, I'm not sure if you have heard of them. They're called the lamplighter groups. And the reason they're called lamplighter groups is that there is some, actually a nice description of them as some, a lamplighter traveling along, turning lights on and off. But I will not be using that description. Um, in fact, uh, <coughs> I don't even have to give you the algebraic definition of them, but don't worry, I will, because all I will care about is their geometry. But for those of you who are more algebraically inclined, let me tell you which groups I'm talking about. So gamma is going to be the wreath product of Z3 with Z. And this has a finite index subgroup um, that is the wreath product of uh, the, the, the product of Z3 with Z3 um, with Z. Okay, so if you really want to know the definition of wreath product, this is just uh, the direct sum of Z copies um, of Z3, uh, 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 semi-direct Z, okay? So this is this one right here. In general, a uh, lamplighter group, so this is a side note. Has the form um, finite group wreath Z. Okay, so where the finite group has order, let's say, n. Okay, so this is a general lamplighter group. Okay, but like I said, I don't care about this, um, this formulation. All I care about is the Cayley graph. So the Cayley graph of F wreath Z is the distal leader graph and called, I will call it D, L, N, N. Okay, so where N depends on the order of the finite group. Okay. So today, so for the rest of this talk, what I will, I will ignore the group structure and I will just talk, tell you about the geometry of these distal leader graphs. And in particular, okay, so in particular I need, I will tell you about the distal leader graph 3, 3, and this distal leader graph will be 9, 9. Okay, so this is associated to um, gamma, and this is associated to gamma naught. Okay. So some of you might be thinking I have this backwards. This is an people think this, but I, I will show you using the geometry that this is actually not the case. Okay, you can figure it out algebra, using algebra, but um, I'll show you using geometry. Okay, so geometry. Okay, so first I need to, so the, these graphs are going to be built out of two trees, so I need to define some trees for you. Um, T subscript N plus 1 
is going to be the n plus 1 valent tree with um, each vertex has, uh, so each vertex has n incoming edges and one outgoing edge. So this is, this is an infinite tree. It's infinite and regular. So using this, uh, this description, we can start to build it. So here I have a vertex. I have um, n incoming edges. Let's, let's make n3. And one outgoing edge. Okay. And then I repeat this process at every vertex. Okay, and I can keep going. So here I could have drawn some more here, but my blackboard space is limited. So let me stop right here. Um, right, the key is not to think of this as a rooted tree. It doesn't stop here. It keeps going. There is no root, okay? Every vertex looks the same. Um, one other useful feature of this tree is I will have this height function to z. So this is a height function. And you can define it just by picking a base point, let's call it x0, and mapping that base point to 0. And then depending on the orientation, this gives me, uh, this gives me the map onto z, onto, well, the vertices map onto z. If I include edges, you can map them also onto r. So there's a height function from this tree to, to r. And just to specify, I will make this 1 and 2. So this is going to be negative 1, negative 2. But you can pick it however you want. All right. So now DLNN is actually going to be a subset of a product of trees. Such that the heights. Um, add up to zero, or in or another way to say, the height of one point is negative the height of the other point. Okay, so maybe the product of trees is a bit hard to visualize. Let me draw it like this. So here's my first tree, and my second tree I'm going to draw upside down, and the reason I do this is that now two points, let's make this P, two points at the same height represent one point, one vertex in my graph DLNN. So here's one point. Let's find another point. Um, here's, let's call this P prime, Q prime. Here's another point. So I've just given you the points right now. Um, edges, so two, two edges in my trees correspond to an edge if, so let me say it this way, two pairs of points in here have an edge between them if the corresponding pairs of points have an ed edge between them in the trees, okay? Now, I personally maybe don't like this way of seeing these graphs. It wasn't until I actually built myself a model <laughs> that I could see it much better. So here, this is not the DL33. If you count carefully, you will see this is DL22. So here's one tree. And if I look from the other side, I have the other tree. Okay? So I will pass this around. You can, uh, I think you've already played with it. So. But uh, <clears throat> this is what an actual portion of this graph looks like. Okay. So this is DL33 or a portion of DL33. 
Um, I promised you I'd talk about DL99, so as you can imagine, this is more of a pain to draw, but let me draw it anyway. Okay, so here is, here is DL99. Okay, there are nine, um, so of course there should be something coming out here, but there are nine incoming um, vertices and uh, edges and one outgoing. Now the reason I have drawn it like this is because I promised to show you this inclusion here. So here's gamma, here's gamma, gamma naught, there is a finite index inclusion here, and we should be able to see it on the level of Cayley graph. Can you see it now? So, let's see. Maybe I will use, oh, I've used up all my colors. Okay, so this blue, so all the points here, okay, so any two points here represent one point in my graph, they get mapped to points up here. Okay, so this gets mapped here. Um, let me use yellow here. So all of these points, and there are nine of them, get mapped to nine points here. Okay, and in particular, what you miss is every second level. So you can see that this right here is an index two inclusion. And if you did the algebra calculation while, uh, while we were waiting, then uh, you, can, you actually can check that, in fact, this is an index 2 subgroup um, of, of this, this group here. Okay? Um, oh, and I also have a little picture for this. So here is, again, this is DL22. This is DL44. And you can see the index 2 inclusion. So every level here has four points, okay, and here again we have four points on top, four points on bottom, and I'm missing the four points in the middle, so you can look at that inclusion there. Okay, so now I'm ready for some claims. So I'm going to write down three claims and then I'm going to discuss them. So claim one is that if there exists a two-to-one map or two-to-one quasi-isometry from DL99 to itself, then the composition um, of phi with inclusion map then this is a bounded distance from a bijection. So that's claim one. Claim two um, is that any bijective quasi-isometry let's say phi prime from DL99 to DL33 arises this way. Okay, i.e., what do I mean? I mean that phi prime is bounded distance, let's say, in the soup norm from phi i for some phi. Okay, and claim three uh, there does not exist a two to one phi that is a Q, two to one and a quasi isometry. Okay, so these three steps, um, well, at least these two steps should convince you that um, this will prove the theorem. Okay, so I. So let me start with the first one. Okay, so 
If I have a two-to-one quasi-asymmetry, now I, I allow it to be any kind of quasi-asymmetry. Definitely, Z has two-to-one quasi-asymmetries, right? Z has two-to-one, so what do I have to do? I just divide by two, right? If I divide by two, then every point gets hit twice. That's a quasi-isometry. Um, it's not bounded distance from bijection, but it's still quasi-isometry. Now, uh, okay, so let me look at this map. So, so what am I doing here? So if I have, let, maybe it's easier to think back in terms of dollars. So if I have each point has one dollar, and now I hit it with phi, every point has two dollars. If I include it now into this picture here, then every second level has two dollars. And I missed every other level. So all I have to do is share a dollar with my neighbor, and now everybody has a dollar. So I have a bijective map. Okay. So this, this, one, this one is easy. Number two, this is an exercise. This, I claim this is also easy. And all you need to do is play around with the geometry here. In fact, if you want to um, demonstrate the proof for me at the end of this lecture, then you will get one of these as a present of your choice, okay? So, so work hard. Um, claim three is the hard one. And claim three is what I will spend the remainder of my 15 minutes on, okay? So, um, so we will focus on claim three. Okay, so we will want to show that there is no two-to-one quasi-isometry of DL99, okay? And so, just a little hint of why, why maybe I picked some of these numbers. Um, two and nine have no common divisors, so. So this is a hint of, of why. Okay, and the reason is, um, I mean, what is, the, what is the obvious way to get a two to one map? Well, I showed you how to do it with z. You divide by two, then every point gets two points. Okay, now if you try to do the same thing, even in, a tr in just the tree, trying to divide by two here, you will, you will be moving points, uh, points that are close, you'll be moving them further and further apart. So it's not going to be a quasi-assumptory. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the next part of this talk will give you sort of a flavor of some of the techniques we use in geometric group theory. Okay, and some of the techniques we use to study the structure of quasi-isometry. So this is exactly what I need to know. I need to know what do my quasi-isometries look like? Okay. So this is actually um, work of Eskin, Fisher, and White. And it's just a special case of a, a much bigger theorem. But um, we'll just focus on, on these right here. So before I can state the theorem, let me, I need to tell you more about the geometry. In particular, I have to tell you about boundaries. Okay, so boundaries of DL and N, and first, boundaries of the tree. Okay, so, so this, Officially, I will define boundary of a tree just to be classes of, uh, vert well, actually I can just define it to be vertical geodesics. So what do I mean by that? I mean lines that um, preserve this height function, so all vertical geodesics. So this is how I want to define it, but really how I want to think of it I want to think of it as sort of this boundary at infinity here, 
Okay, so each vertical geodesic is specified by one point on the boundary. Okay. Okay, so those are vertical geodesics. I have a natural metric on the boundary, so let me just call it D. Well, I don't want to write D partial TN. Um, how am I going to define this metric? Well, if I have two points, maybe I drew my boundary a little too low. Let's call them eta and C, because those are good boundary point names. I look at vertical geodesics that represent these points. So now these points, these geodesics intersect at some point. Okay, let's call it U. So I'm going to define the distance between eta and C to be um, n to the height of u. So this defines a metric. Okay. I also have uh, a measure on here. So let me define for you the measure. Okay. Um, let me pick another point now. Let's call this v. I can define the sort of this shadow of V to be all vertical geodesics passing through V. Okay, so you can see this will be all of all of these points here. Okay, so shadow V. Okay. And this actually, let me call this C, this is actually a ball in this metric. So C is a ball, and the diameter of C, maybe I should stop writing it. The diameter of C is just um, n to the height of V. Okay, so I can define a measure to be so a measure of, let's say, a finite union of balls is just going to be the sum of the diameters, okay? So the diameters of CI. Okay, and actually, I'm, I only need finite unions of balls. These are the only sets I'm really going to consider. Can I ask? Yeah? So is the boundary of this tree going to be forming the whole real line or something that no, in fact, with this, with this metric, what we get is that punchline, punchline, don't have space here. What we get is that the boundary is actually, can be identified with the n-adic rationals. Okay? And one way to see that is label your uh, edges by numbers going from 0 to n minus 1, then every vertical geodesic determines um, a series. So it determines a point in Qn. Okay? So with this, with this metric, this is just the anatic rationals. Um, okay, so finally, so I've defined the boundary of a tree. What about the boundary of D, L, and N. So what do vertical geodesics look like in D, L, and N? Um, okay, so what I need to do is I need to specify two lines now. Okay. And this will give me one vertical geodesic, but in fact, um, here, the, here we actually have to have um, equivalence classes of vertical geodesic rays. Uh, or vertical geodesics. And actually, we're going to have two different, um, two different problems because in one direction I'm going up in the tree, in the other direction I'm going down in the tree. So I will actually have two boundaries here, okay? So the lower boundary will be equivalence classes of vertical geodesic rays 
that are going up or upward oriented. Oh, that should be upper boundary. And the lower boundary will be going down. Um, and I didn't tell you what the equivalence is. The equivalence is just that their distance in this graph uh, is bounded, okay, or goes to zero. Um, so since I'm running out of time, let me just tell you, this is actually just, again, both of these boundaries are just, again, the an addicts, okay? And now I can state the theorem of S. Kim Fisher White. It says that any quasi isometry of DL and N to itself induces um, maps of the boundaries, I'll call them phi L, phi U, um, and the boundaries are just QN. So I have two maps of QN to itself. And these maps are both by Lipschitz. OK. With respect to the metric I defined here. OK. Is it compared with the adding metric on QN? Yeah, it's, this is the same metric. It's the same metric. Yeah. OK. So. Let me just um, so this is sort of one one theme in geometric group theory is that we define some sort of structure such that our quasi isometry actually turns into a nicer map, for instance, on the boundary. Okay, so a quasi isometry of the interior turns into a, a by Lipschitz map of the boundary. And in this case, let me tell you what we know about by Lipschitz maps of QN. Actually, let me, yeah, by Lip maps of QN. Um, okay. And this is a theorem due to Cooper. And it says that if I have a by Lipschitz map of QN, then on some nice subset, and this will be a union of fi a finite union of balls, there exists a nice subset and a constant lambda such that for any nice subset, again a finite union of balls, the measure of the image of B over the measure of B is just lambda. Okay. So this is this gives us um, sort of control of what this map does on some small subset. Okay. So now let me finish the proof. So remember, I'm trying to show there is no two-to-one map of um, DL99 to itself. So let me start that. So finishing. So what do I have? Okay, phi is a 2 to 1 map, 2 to 1 quasi isometry, and we want a contradiction. Okay, so what do we have so far? So phi is a quasi isometry, so that means by Eskin Fisher White, um, we have two boundary maps uh, of QN that are by Lipschitz. Okay. The next step is by Cooper. We have two subsets, uh, ALAU, and two constants. such that this map, so this, this I, I'll call this measure linear, so this map is measure linear, or such, such that star holds, so I don't have much time. Okay, that. Now, um, because I'm out of time, there's actually uh, this sort of standard zooming argument in 
uh, that we can use, which is key to, we can actually expand these, um, these uh, subsets so that our map is measure linear on all of Q. Okay, so this is, so um, we, zooming is conjugating by a sequence of isometries. Uh, we converge to a different quasi-isometry that is two to one still, and measure and star is satisfied on all of Q. Okay, and the last steps are that lambda L and lambda U are powers of three. Okay, and using this, I can build a quasi-isometry uh, from DL and N99 to itself that is three to one, or powers of that is lambda L lambda U to one, and it is bounded distance from my map phi bar. So let's, what does this mean? Well, but this means that DL and DL99 has a Ponzi scheme. Well, why is that? If I have a map that's two to one, and it's bounded distance from that that's three to one, by moving things a bounded distance, I get something where people have more money than they started with. Okay, so this is a contradiction. So that's it. <laughs>